Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 10th Annual Film and Discussion Series. Uh, we look forward to uh, welcoming those back who have been with us throughout these years. And, and also, here we are. If, if this is uh, your first time with us, welcome. We're really glad you're with us. Tonight, we're going to be exploring the land and black hands. Um, and this year's series, we've been really inspired by the unprecedented upheaval of our global community. And we're, we were seeking to find programs and groundbreaking solution-based ideas to some of the world's most pressing challenges. And tonight's program strives to shine a light on Land in Black Hands, an innovative local program designed to explore black land access and economic development strategies in black communities. We are very lucky to be joined by uh, tonight by Shanika Bowen. Bowden and director of, she's director of culture and engagement and sustainable living at Kingston Land Trust and Land in Black Hand Steering Committee member, Cassandra Taylor for the, uh, of the Underground Center. But before I go into introducing them, I'd like to just talk a bit about our sponsors. The Woodstock Land Conservancy is a nonprofit organization committed to the protection and uh, preservation of open lands, forest, water resources, and scenic areas, and historic sites in Woodstock and the surrounding areas. Also, Woodstock Transition is uh, another sponsor and is uh, a part of a global transition town movement of communities working to reimagine and rebuild our world in response to the challenges of our time. Woodstock Transition has locally engaged to strengthen our community and resilience and cre uh, by creating positive alternatives. The Woodstock Jewish Congregation, our third sponsor, is dedicated to the advancement of Jewish ethics, culture, religion, and sustainable practices. They strive to enable participants to enrich their lives and, and, and their communities throughout worship, celebration, practice, study, and fellowship. I'd like to mention a couple uh, items as far as tonight. If you don't already, if you have your view as being in the uh, speaker view, that's great. That'll probably enable you to see the people who are speaking more clearly. If you do not, and you have what is known as gallery view, and you're seeing all the faces in front of you, then you might want to go to your upper right-hand corner and click on um, choose speaker view that will enable you to have a better connection with those who are speaking tonight. So tonight uh, we're asking for people to offer donate, uh, uh, if you're interested in giving a donation. There we go. I was, I was muted for a second. I think Ellie was trying to give me a message. <laughs> Anyways. Um, tonight we're asking people to give donations to, uh, rather than to ourselves here who put these events on, but to um, provide support in the Land and Black Hands program so they can continue to do their incredible work, which you'll lo learn more about tonight. That link will be provided in the chat by Ellie tonight and then again at the end of the evening. So you'll be able to access that link and provide donations there. So right now I'd like to invite Shanika, Shaniqua to, uh, to join us and give a brief introduction to, to Shaniqua first. Shaniqua, as I said, is the Director of Cultural Engagement and Sustainable Living at Kingston Land Trust. And Shaniqua first fell in love with green space as a kid dancing under the stars in her hometown of South Boston, Virginia. Who knew that there was a South Boston in Virginia? And later in New York City. And she is now a resident of Kingston, New York for the past 10 years. In Kingston Land Trust, she leads a virtual series called Land and Resilience. And on how the land can, be, can meet the community's needs. She also leads the Community Land Trust um, Land and Black Hands Initiative, of which you'll learn more about. She has been um, the point person for Kingston's 
housing initiatives, including her participation in the development of a community land trust in Kingston. So right now, uh, I would like to just hand it over to Shaniqua and, and uh, she will guide us through the balance of the evening and explain to you what to expect for this, for this evening. Shaniqua, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Kirk. Um, yeah, and I'd also like to thank uh, the Woodstock Land Conservancy for inviting me to share the work of the Kingston Land Trust with all of you and our Land in Black Hands program. Uh, which is truly an extraordinary program, I think, because it really extends the role of what a land trust can do beyond conservation and crossing into the lines of social justice work. So um, I've been asked to tell you a little bit more about um, Land in Black Hands. I believe um, it would give a little context to the video that um, you all are gonna see in just a few. And um, your question may be, how did the Kingston Land Trust come to do the type of work that I'm describing? How did we cross the lines into social justice work? And as a small urban land trust, we wanted to impact the population that we serve here in Kingston um, as a whole. Uh, for the first 10 years, the land trust was volunteer run by the board of directors. And when I was hired in 2018, I was part of the first um, team of staff members uh, that the land trust had ever had. And, and still am. Um, as the staff, we had already inherited some projects like the Kingston Green Line, which you may have heard of, um, a non-motorized trail system that was a collaboration with the city and county. Um, but we also wanted to recognize the feedback of the other voices that we were hearing here in the city um, from people who were housing insecure. Um, and there was a realization at that time that if people were facing insecurities around housing, then that meant they were also experiencing insecurities around access to land. So we definitely wanted to do something about that. And so um, I'm just going to review some history with you so that you can see like why this is important, um, why the work of the Land and Black Hands program is important and what is it that we uh, uh, stand to address with our work. So just so you know, not too long ago, exactly 112 years ago. Um, so I guess that's, that's long when you look at like a lifetime of 112 years, but when you look at um, the extension of our country and America and so on, 112 years ago is not really that long, right? And in 1910, black land ownership would, was at its peak. African-Americans made up approximately 14% of all US farmers, and they owned somewhere between 16 and 19 million acres of land. And that means that um, black people at that time had a, a significant amount of power and independence to economically provide for themselves and for their families. And so um, I'm gonna take you through a little timeline because I'm not sure if everyone like remembers all of these exact dates. But we're looking at a time when slavery had just ended in 1865. And so by 1910, black land ownership was at its highest point, right? And I think somewhere in there, um, there was also another realization by um, government or whomever didn't want, um, whoever, whomever was able to see the progress of you know, that set of people and then decide that um, they wanted to make some change, that they had the power to change that, right? And so due to increased uh, legal discrimination, such as like Jim Crow laws and many things like that, there was uh, the need for the civil rights movement. We all remember the civil rights movement. And during the civil rights struggle, between the years of 1950 and 1969, 6 million acres were lost. And if you think about it, six million acres equals like the size of Vermont and New Hampshire put together. So then in 1979, I was born. <laughs> that's a little joke. Um, in a minute, I'll tell you why that's significant because I think, you know, we're in a time now, 2022, right? And we think we've progressed so far past slavery and it's like, why are we having this conversation? Slavery is over. Um, you know, we've had a black president, so let's move on. But I guess the point that I'm making is that I'm 42 years old. 
Um, I was born in 1979, and I'm doing the work today at the Kingston Land Trust, which is sort of an extension of work that's been done during the civil rights movement. And that work is was inherit. That work was a response to um, Jim Crow laws and discrimination. And that all came about because, again, we had slaves that were just freed in 1865. So as you see, from 1865 to, to until today, I am still like continuing the work of, you know, like what the civil rights movement was doing in a way. And so in, in that uh, snapshot, you actually see that slavery, the ending of slavery wasn't really that long ago, right? And that we're still living through the effects of um, decisions that were made back then. So fast forward to, let's say 2012. Um, a moment ago, I just uh, told you that uh, black land ownership was at its highest. But then by 2012, black Americans represented only 1.6% of farmers um, in America. And that decreased um, farmland ownership into, into 3.6 million acres of land. So we went from nearly 19 million acres to 3.6 acres, <laughs> 3.6 million acres um, in that portion of time, right? So land being the basis of everything, folks migrated here from multiple European countries. Um, they employed a range of tactics, including negotiations, treaties, genocide. The battle has always been about land. And um, Blacks were reduced, um, Blacks were brought into this country as slave labor um, to work the land. And when Blacks were set free, many of them were looking to make a place for themselves. They wanted to you know, be autonomous. They wanted to be landowners. They wanted to be just as, as successful as um, their white slave masters at some point. Um, but the government did not compensate any of those slaves when they were released um, for any of their stolen labor. Um, they weren't compensated for any of their contributions towards making this country as great of a nation as it is. Um, so they were set free one day with no jobs, uh, no land, no place to go. And as you may imagine, it wasn't long before they realized that um, they couldn't do much with their, you know, with their freedom due to their economic, their economic disadvantage. Um, so many of them became sharecroppers. And um, it has been said that sharecropping is very comparable to just a modern, um, a modern form of slavery. So please keep in mind um, the timeline that we're looking at here. And again, by 2012, Blacks represented only 1.6% of the farming community, right? So at this time, I'm, I'm going to ask you all to sort of um, engage in a small um, exercise with me, right? And so when I say that, I want you to, I'm going to ask you to imagine a series of things. And if you want to close your eyes, that's fine. Uh, whichever way gives you more access to your memories, um, because what we're going to do is an, a small exercise in examining the sources of your current economic status. Okay, so this is something that we all can do, um, no matter who you are. All right, so I'd like you to think about the sources of your family's wealth. And next to that, I also I'm going to ask you to pull out this a great big imaginary calculator. All right. So the first thing I want you to imagine is if you never received an inheritance of any kind, right? So some of us have received an inheritance. And if, you're, if you are one of those people, I want you to take out your big calculator and subtract that amount from your family's um, economic wealth at this point in time. The next thing I want you to do is imagine that your parents never received an inheritance of any kind. Okay, so if your parents received an inheritance from their parents or anyone else, if they inherited a house, if they inherited a car, whatever they inherited, I'd like you to subtract that from your, you know, use your big imaginary cal um, calculator and subtract that amount as well. 
The next thing I want you to imagine is if you or your parents never had access to any federal um, programs, that means like FHA or VA mortgage that paved the way for home ownership between the years of 1910 and 1968. So if anyone, you or any of your family received a home during that time um, through these programs, I'd like you to take out your big calculator and subtract that as well. Now, imagine if you or your parents never received access to a GI bill. All right, GI bills are very important. And if you never received any kind of benefit or access to one, um, or I'm sorry, if you have, I want you to subtract that from your big imaginary calculator. And imagine if the lack of any of these resources also kept, kept you from going to college. All right, so a lot of people were able to have their parents pay for college, um, to borrow money against their homes, or use inherited money to go to college. So if any of those funds were available to you that paid for your college education, I'd like you to also subtract that um, from your wealth. Now, this list can get really long and extensive and specific, and I can't possibly name all the things. So this is where I'm gonna ask you to use your own discernment, right? If any of the sources of your family's wealth is something along the lines of what I've mentioned, just imagine that you never received that benefit. And you imagine that by using your imaginary calculator to subtract that from your family's wealth. And I want you to think about how all of these subtractions would have affected your economic status today. Now, the only thing you can, if any of you won the lottery, okay, or your parents won the lottery, that money you can keep. <laughs> but none of these other funds you can keep, okay? All right, so I'm gonna ask you all to open your eyes. Yeah, and you don't have to actually report back, but um, it's a way of sort of thinking about, um, you know, some of the benefits, right? And these benefits, the ones that I'm mentioning, a lot of them, especially during the years that I mentioned, weren't available to Black families. They were made available to white families, but they weren't, you know, legally, um, it was against the law to, um, for Blacks to apply for certain loans and, um, and things like that. And I'm sure you've all heard of redlining, right? So the following information, I'm going to read to you is based on a book entitled The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. And this is the last thing I have for you before we start the film. This particular book uh, was written by Richard Rothstein. And this is not an excerpt from the book, but this is based on the book. Today, there exists both a wealth gap and a wage gap. African-American incomes on average are about 60% of the average white family's income. But African-American wealth is about 5% of white wealth. Or in other words, the average white family has 10 times the wealth of the average black family. And most middle-class families in this country, their gains, oh, gains their wealth from the equity that they have in their homes. So this enormous difference between 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is almost entirely attributed to federal housing policy implemented throughout the 20th century. African-American families that were prohibited from buying homes in the suburbs in the 1940s and 50s, and even in the 1960s by the Federal Housing Administration, that is the FHA, gained none of the equity appreciation that whites gained. In the late 1940s and 1950s, these homes were sold for about twice the national medium income. They were affordable to working class families with an FHA or VA mortgage. 
and African Americans were equally able to afford those homes as whites were, but they were prohibited from buying them. So today, those homes sell for about 300,000 or 400,000 at the minimum, which is way more than the national median income. So in just 1968, we passed the uh, Fair Housing Act that you know, put all of that to an end. Um, and that's when um, I wanna say, but there, it says here that there was an empty promise because the homes, um, they al finally allowed blacks to buy these homes, but the homes were no longer affordable by the time that this particular act was implemented. So those families couldn't avoid, I'm um, sorry, couldn't afford those homes and the opportunity had already been missed and the equity had already been gained by other families and it was no longer available for, um, th that investment was no longer available for black families to take advantage of. So today, whites own 98% of the land, okay? And blacks own less than 2% of land. Now, if you remember, we started this story in 1910 when blacks owned between 16 and uh, 19 million. And although that sounds like a lot, it was still only 14%, right? Of all, um, of all farmers. So there was still plenty of land left for everyone else. Not like blacks were taken over. <laughs> um, but now today we are at less than 1% ownership. And so these, um, these results that you're seeing is the culmination of all these things that we've talked about, of all the things that I've discussed. And so this is why we feel it's necessary um, for there to be a program that concentrates on how do we help black land ownership. Um, the program I'm describing is Land in Black Hands. And so this program is working to create a network of all the other black farmers in the world who are doing something to turn these statistics around. We don't want it to be believed that um, black farmers ship is a dying breed. Uh, we definitely want to help these people to gain the land that they need to do the things that they want to do and be autonomous, you know, like everyone else. So without further ado, we are going to show you um, the first event that we held during Black History Month in 2019 uh, with a panel of um, Black farmers from across the Northeast talking about the challenges and the successes that they've had around Black land ownership. Good afternoon, everyone. We're just gonna jump into it. I don't think I have to say anything else. So we're here to talk about, oh, excuse me. We're here to talk about black land, hands in the soil, resilience, democracy, a history of freedom, a history of regenerative practice. practice. We're here to talk about liberated freedom zones. We're gonna talk about feeding people who need the food and the access. We're gonna talk about, Karen, what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about black land, y'all. And first of all, I'm proud to be a woman up here, a black woman up here, a black woman farmer up here, because let's talk about history. It's the women that have been out there really doing the work when it comes to agriculture. So I just wanna give a big up to our you know, our black ancestors, women ancestors. And I wanna talk about land and how precious land is, and also being a farmer. Right now, we are in New York State. And if you look at the census, out of 55,000 white farmers, there's only 164 black farmers. And so, right off the bat, we're talking about the inequities that we're already seeing now, even in the 21st century, in New York State. And if you look around other states within these United States, the amount of black farmers and black land continues to diminish right now as we're talking. So the question I pose is like, what are we gonna do about it? 
What are we going to do about it? Because I always say that I'm still waiting for my 40 acres and a mule. And if, you know, and to look at that in terms of what if we did have that 40 acres and a mule, like what would the world look like? What would wealth and power among black people look like? So I'm here to talk about black land. Yeah. Ed, what are we going to talk about? I want to talk about black land in the, con uh, in the context. <clears throat> I want to talk about black land in the context of us thinking about what is sacred on the one hand and what is instrumental on the other. Because I think it gives us a good insight into what is wrong with the existing system within which we live and what might be important features of that which we must build. Thank you. Jalal. Um, all that sounds great. I want to talk about all those things. Um, my point of view is, comes from an abolitionist, like she mentioned. So what is abolition, reparations, repatriation? How do we talk about all those things that are not being talked about on a wide level? So what does that look like? on a local level, regional level, national level, world level, like how do we actually get reparations for our people that have been like unjustly treated throughout the history? So that's what I want to talk about. All right. So, excuse me. Because I have one question on my mind at any given time, which is how do we sustain the celebrations of the commons? I really want to know what is it that the commons means to you all? Because I know you're out there. Who wants to go first? One of the things you're all going to notice, I'm very shy. Um, I think that the commons is a really important concept that has been, uh, like a lot of other important concepts, it's been abused by academia. And I say that because at some points when you look up the word commons, some of the first things that pop up are the tragedy of the commons. And the commons have only been tragic since they were, since the effort has been made to destroy them. Um, because prior to that, it was the way we lived for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, I think it's really important to realize that this earth that we live on, and we're talking about land, which is the, this, this earth concept, uh, once belonged to us all by virtue of the fact that none of us made it, none of us had a claim on it, None of us were going to pick it up and take it home with us. And it was something that we shared together. And in our sharing of it, we blended our human labor with the land. And from it, we have produced a social product, which is everything else. So all there is is the earth, the land, human labor that is capable of working it, and the product of human labor on the earth and the land, which takes a number of different forms. One of the forms that it takes is capital, but I will assure you that it's not the only form that it takes. Other forms that it takes is infrastructure, it's systems. There are all kinds of things that are the product of, 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 uh, of human labor on the land. And that land was common. It was common to us all until some brilliant, or should we say sick, person came up with the idea of enclosing it, of claiming it, of laying claim to this land. Land that in many cultures cannot even be owned. In many cultures, people will say, you can't own the land, the land owns you. And yet there were those who felt that land ownership was a natural thing to exist, and that land ownership confers to the owner the right to lay claim to all of the surplus production of that land, which is an incredible claim to make, given that that surplus production has to come from many hands, and yet it goes to the one owner who lays claim to this land that was once common. So the tragedy is that some academic passed off an idea not all that long ago that that won't work. It's, again, in spite of the fact that it's how we live for well over 100,000 years, but now, this notion that it won't work leads people to say, 
that it is necessary for land to be privately held in order for it to be efficiently used. And if we look around us, what we see is anything but efficiency in this world of selfish, greedy, uh, private ownership of land. And I think that part of our task in reestablishing the commons is to go back to a much more humane way for people to live in coexistence with each other and again benefit from the land in such a way that we, the workers of the land, are able to enjoy and utilize for ourselves and for those who come after us the product of our own labor. And it is being separated from the product of one's own labor that became at one point a functional definition of what it meant to be enslaved. Yeah, that's deep. What I'd like to also add is the fact that, and also to talk about what um, Ed has been saying, if you think about indigenous cult culture, we never owned anything. So our forefathers, our ancestors never owned land. We never owned seed. We never owned animal and we never owned people. And until we started looking in terms of land ownership and also looking at food in terms of a commodity and place value on it, then the capitalistic system came in whereby instead of being an incentive for people to quote own something, it, it was a system that came in and started to extract. And so then how do we move forward from that extractive principle and thinking about land ownership in a way where people together in, a, in terms of a collaboration work the land and that the resources are not extracted but come back into the community and the community as a whole benefits from it. Yeah, I think what comes up for me is actually like doing the work. Um, the commons feels like, you know, that makes common sense, but it actually doesn't work when we've been conditioned to not live in a common way with each other. So I think what has to happen is a conversation on how do we actually not only create common land and talk about what land sovereignty looks like, but how do we build relationships with each other that are more in that. a sovereign way where we I depend upon each other, that. the interdependence that hasn't been happening. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, just to continue in the, the, with the, the train that we have going on here, um, I think we talk about the commons and the commons is very much a concept, right? It is, it, we can impose that concept onto a space, but it is truly through practice, through our relationships, that the commons emerges. And I mean, we, we don't really talk about the, the practice of the commons. We don't really talk about wh what, what we're doing in that space as much, except for when we get into a space of uh, talking about cooperative economics, right? We talk a lot about the commons or about collab collaborative uh, work in cooperative economics. Um, and, but we also don't really talk as much as we can engage a, a, a a theory, a global theory of the commons. We don't always talk about what that looks like locally. We have a lot of conversations about local economies, but not necessarily a local commons and how it takes more than just an institution, but it takes people reaching out uh, as people, not as people who are, not as organizers, but as people who are organizing. That's a practice of the commons, to recognize that you are a person engaging in something, a common activity, right? Um, which being, yes, Karen. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, like, I totally agree. I think, um, you know, we sit on this panel and there are a lot of people out there that really understand the concept of the commons and con concept of food and land in general. But I think what needs to be done is really just sort of an, a strong educational piece because people have been blinded for so long in working in terms of, it's, you know, it's for me, I need to own this. And so what we have to do is really start tearing down those barriers and reframing on how we work together 
and really educating people. For me, it's, for me, it's like starting in terms of community organizing, really sitting down with people and starting to educate on what that means to work collaboratively, what that means to share, what that means to be able to think about what wealth looks like. Uh, wealth within a community for so long, wealth and, 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 and resources have been extracted. So then how do we sort of start talking about in terms of, of, of gathering our resources so that, and also our governance, our governance so that we become self-reliant, self-sufficient in a way that it impacts everyone and then everyone has a voice and everyone has an opportunity to participate. Um, right now, that's not happening. We know we're in, a, we're in this capitalistic system where it's all about I and it's all about me. And so for me, it's really getting into my community and taking down those layers and starting having that conversation about the strength that we have and also changing the lens on how people look like people like me that live in low-income neighborhoods for so long, I'm going to slow you down, for so long, you know, have been stigmatized as, 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 as a group that doesn't have self-worth. But when I look at my community, I see the richness and the wealth that they have because for so long they have been doing so much with so little resources. Um, doing so much for so long with so little resources is something black folks have been doing on this land for a really, really long time. I and mean, before that time, before some of these concepts, before this language entered this space, we know that other people were doing these things for a really long time. I want to know if any of you would like to speak to that a bit and then maybe link that to some of the local work that you're doing in your spaces. I'd like to speak to it and I'll try to be able, to, I will try to be able to link it to local work. Um, I don't stay home very much so sometimes my work is is uh, over the south, and sometimes it brings me up to Kingston, New York, where I've never been before. Um, but I really, I really want us to think about this idea of what is sacred, because I know we, many of us who know about other cultures different from the American capitalist culture, recognize that different things are held sacred by people, and in many cultures, the land and animal life and air and water and sunlight are all held to be sacred. Animal life, human life, they're all held to be sacred. To me, it's really, really important that you know the difference between what is sacred and what is instrumental. Because if I, as I have read histories, I was reading this history of Europe one time, and they were talking about the history of Europe since World War I. And they started talking about what Europeans did relative to the African land mass and what Europeans did in, in Asia and, you know, Europeans' uh, efforts to hold on to some of the colonies in the Western Hemisphere and, and Spain and it losing its empire. And I'm realizing, oh, you're just talking about what Europeans did in this context where everything else in the world was instrumental to that history. That that the active component of that history is only a group of people in one part of the world. My contention is it wasn't even all of them. It was really uh, a history of European capital and those institutions required to concentrate that capital in the, in, the, in the handful of hands that it was. And even parts of Europe were held to be instrumental, simply tools for something else. The land itself and again, I want to say something about land, water, and air, because we talk about land as though it is uniquely important. And while it has its own special role that it plays, it's quite frankly no more important than is water and air. The difference between land, water, and air is that land has been more completely commodified. It has been converted into something that is bought and sold, in spite of the fact that a lot of cultures would have never thought about doing that. Thought it was a, an abomination to even dream of buying and selling land. Water is life. Air is the essence on which we require. We can't make it but a couple of minutes without air. We can't go but a few days without water. And so they're not less important. It's just that nobody is right now, except in the case of water, 
buying and selling it. And again, they're moving to do this even with air. So the, the effort, if you were to leave the control in the world in the hands of the ones who have brought us to where we are, there would be a point in the near future in which water and air, much like land, is commodified, bought and sold, and those who don't have the wherewithal to be able to buy enough of it will die. Right now we have a system where it is perfectly legal for the people who own private property that other people require in order to stay alive to deny access to that property to those other people in such a way that the other people will die. That is legal in this country right now as we speak. Because if you own a factory that people need to work in in order to pay their bills or buy food, and you say, it's mine, I want to close it because it's not making me enough profit, then you can close it. They can't work, and they're hungry. And if you don't believe me, you can look in the past at the scenes outside of the factories as they were being shuttered in Gary, Indiana, in, in Detroit, and any number of other places where there were people perfectly capable of working and being productive who were denied the opportunity to do so because the owners of those places didn't feel they were making enough money to warrant leaving them open. So already we have this thing where private property allows a handful of people to be in control of the life and death of masses, all right? So this land that we are on now, and I'm reminded of it as I drive into upstate New York. I drove up from, from the airport in a rental car. This land once and not all that long in the past, was the proud hunting grounds and, and, and planting grounds and burial grounds of a proud people who wouldn't dream of selling it, but they knew how to use it and use it well for their needs and interests. The folk, the invaders who came in took advantage of the fact that there were some people who were suffering from disease, other people who were migrating to other places, and other people who could not withstand the might of the military apparatus that they were able to bring to bear, took and seized this land, claimed it for their own, and set up the condition from then on in which people could use it to stay alive or not use it and have to die or move someplace else. And again, as we all understand history, people were pushed further and further uh, away toward less fertile grounds toward places that had less spiritual significance, to places that were to them less sacred. And this sacred layer was, was taken and seized by somebody who no longer held it to be sacred, but took it as being simply instrumental. So in our system now, people hold as sacred capital, the constant expansion of profits, the existence of free markets, all of these things was held as being sacred that's why they market fundamentalists, capitalists, all of them hold those things to be sacred. And what is instrumental? Human life itself. And you can use it up if you need to in order to preserve that which is sacred. That's what's wrong with capitalism. So I was in a discussion with somebody the other day, and they were saying something about black capitalism. And I go, if you put a color in front of it, does it not still invert the relationship between that which is sacred and that which is instrumental. So somebody was telling me about, well, think about how bad racialized capitalism is. And I go, if you talk about it, is there some good kind of capitalism that isn't racialized, that doesn't invert the relationship between that which is sacred and that which is instrumental? So this land was stolen from some people. It remains in the hands of the thieves. And we have, if we are to, to, to spend our time and effort making right what has been historically unjust. We will find ways to correct that, not to return it to a different private ownership, but recreate those common ownership forms that existed before and are the basis, of, again, of a humane world. And I hope that sort of answered the question, probably. I'm satisfied. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to sort of relate to the work that you know, I'm, tr I'm trying to do here in a lot of urban areas because as I do my travel, there's so many urban areas that have land. And so 
for me is always having the discussion about the importance of land, especially amongst young black and brown brothers and sisters whose parents were originally from the South, came North and left the land. And so having that conversation about the importance of land going back to the land, how for so long we have been distant from the land and as a result we've lost ourselves. And so really having this conversation about young people because I'm 65 years of age and so my job as Mama Karen is to really instill to young people the importance of land, how land is part of their legacy, how land is part of who they are, how farming is part of who we are as agrarian people. And understand that we as black people came here enslaved not because of unskilled labor, but the fact that we came here because we were skilled in agriculture. And once that narrative is spoken to young kids, all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, you know, for so long, I have been brainwashed for so long. I have been taught to go away from the land instead of to go towards the land. And for me personally, it's like putting my hands in the soil. I immediately felt that connection. And so what I try to do is to encourage young people to go back to the land, to encourage young people to have this conversation, oh, to have this conversation, sorry, how important land land matters as you said land matters especially within the black communities and how it's part of who we are i would just add on um to the importance of working with young people um i feel like when i'm working with young people i try to make sure like we have those heroes and like uplifting our freedom fighters and so we haven't really talked about that a lot of people know there's freedom fighters like harriet tubman um, that was, she was freeing slaves or enslaved Africans, but they don't know that she was using the land to actually like lead our people to, to liberation, to freedom. And so when we, when we make that connection for young people, it's like actually tangible. Like our way to get free was to like learn how to live off the land. Harriet Tubman knew how to farm. She was a herbalist. She knew how to heal people from land. If she didn't know how to heal people from land, we wouldn't be able to like actually get our folks free. So talking to young people about those connections between like the, the, those historic examples, like we know about George Washington Carver and like- Who sang to his plants. <laughs> who sang it to his plants. Who treated them with a sacred respect. He sang to his plants. This, and, but just the whole fact of like Tuskegee and that example of how he's the godfather of like urban or, or organic agriculture. And, and knowing who he is and knowing Tuskegee wasn't just like an institution that they um, came out of anywhere. They, they built the bricks to build Tuskegee. Sure so like when you talk about like the self-determination of like, we're not just going to like do farming and like create our own way. We're going to actually build the own bricks to build a, this institution that we need. And so those examples, Fannie Lou Hamer example of like cooperative economics, you know, not just, you know, talking about civil rights, but actually having cooperative economics. Um, but I think there's, there's also like conversations that have been hard for me to figure out around like, we know that reparations need to happen. Um, and I think a lot of us love Bernie Sanders, right? We love Bernie, but Bernie was hard to talk about reparations. And so we talk about all these other things. As was Obama. Obama was hard. He didn't, he didn't have, he couldn't really talk about reparations. He couldn't talk about like what it would look like. People talk about like what you were saying before about like capital. I think it's not just about like capital, right? It's not just about giving black people a check. It's more about like, what is, what, how do we get to skis back? How do we get to the place where we can actually build the bricks to build the institution? So those skills, like having a place that we can like do those hard skills, where we can actually be self-determined and not just get a check. And so what is, is it land grants? Is it, you know, the land trust? What is the thing that reparations could look like where it's not just a check where um, it's gonna go outside of our community? Cause I don't know if y'all watch Netflix, that Killer Mike episode <laughs> where he talks about how like he tried to buy black just for like three days and couldn't do it. Yeah. Do y'all know Killer Mike? He was trying to buy black for three days and couldn't do it. And he was talking about how 
you know, in Asian Chinatown that their, their dollar can like stay in the community for 26 days for black people is six hours. So I think reparations need to look like not just giving a check, but how do we make sure we are building our institutions in a way that can like stay in our community for more than six hours, you know? Yeah. You know, there are two kind of checks. Uh, when you think about money, um, on the one hand, there's the money that goes into consumption. And what we would do when we get it is we would spend it. And somebody who has businesses and stuff would take that as reven business revenues, try to get whatever profit they could off of the fact that somebody spent some money. There's another kind of money that goes into development. It's different from the money we spend and consume. It's the money that we use to build up our own infrastructure, our own educational system, our own things that make life better, our own access to clean water and clean air in the future, our own way to get from place to place. And those things that we do for development, they are again, in a commodity economy like the one we live in, paid for with money, but it's a different kind of money. So I would never want to talk about reparations couldn't be money. I just don't think it should be the kind of money that we would get as a check to spend, the kind that we would consume. All right. So thank you everyone for hanging in there and listening. Hope you feel inspired. Uh, for anyone who recently joined us and wasn't here for the beginning, I'd just like to reiterate that Land and Black Hands is an annual conversation. It started in 2019 as part of the Black History Month program here in Kingston. Um, it has become a local program of the Kingston Land Trust um, exploring Black land access and economic development strategies by bringing together Black community leaders to share ideas, experiences, challenges, victories, all around democratic ownership and agricultural cooperatives and more. And so today, giving you all an update of where we are today um, from where we have come in 2019, these this annual conversation has continued. Um, Land and Black Hands is a growing network of Black farmers, soil engineers, and earth workers who are in love with this natural resource to the point where they, uh, there's an intuition within, within them um, that ownership is a frivolous idea. The land is going to outlive us all as it has already done so, um, so many other civilizations. So instead of owning land, you know, like a slave master, they want to set the land free and be in relationship with it. They want to love it, and listen to it, and listen to its needs and create a symbiotic relationship. And so other updates I'll give you about Land and Black Hands. Um, you know, if you have the means to donate and you would like to donate, we welcome your donations. As you can already see how that, how those funds would be used. Um, to date, so many folks have been inspired by this, um, by this series that we've been running, um, that we've raised $18,000. I want to say that was even before we had created a fund. People just saw the importance and um, pretty much just started sending checks. So therefore, we, we were encouraged to start a fund at that point. And um, we now have a steering committee of about 10 members who are directing what happens with that fund. We'd like to do something significant for the community, of course, um, but it's, uh, for the, it's not just for the benefit of the black community, but is definitely um, created, the effort will be created by members of the black community. And if you don't have the means to donate, that is also fine. You may have land um, in excess that you are not using and that you want to share we have, um, member, we have a land matching uh, program of the Kingston Land Trust where you can go on and, and create a profile and you may have land um, that you wanna share with someone else uh, free of charge, that's the idea, where folks who are looking to use land and don't have access to land um, could grow fresh food on your land or use it for respite purposes or what, whichever uh, you guys agree on, but definitely free of charge. 
And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Cassandra Taylor, who is also one of the members of the Land and Black Hands um, Steering Committee. But beyond that, she is the co-founder and curriculum coordinator for the Underground Center. Cassandra Taylor is a teacher with over 25 years of experience in education. Her educational background is in African-American literature, history, sociology, special education, and critical race theory. After gaining her MSE in secondary education, she helped pioneer literature and history programs for students of color in both her hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and her current home in Socrates, New York. Cassandra has worked as a guest lecturer on many social justice issues, ranging from black feminism, womanism, African traditional religions, poetry and literature from the prison system, portrayals, I'm sorry, yeah, portrayals of African American culture in the media, and the importance of trauma based care in residential facilities for youth. She has also worked as an activist in support of public education and mental health, while also promoting social justice initiatives for people of color, religious minorities women, and those with special needs and LGBTQ youth. So without further ado, I will introduce um, Cassandra Taylor, who is going to um, engage in the Q&A portion of this program. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you. Just a heads up for anybody who would like to ask Cassandra a question, please do so using the chat. Thank you so much. Cassandra, would you like to give a little bit of a description of what you've been working on recently and what kind of direction that you've been, you know, what you've been working on with the Land and Black Hands Initiative or even just, you know, in your own work at the Underground Center? The um partnership with um, Land and Black Hands and the Underground Center um, was one of the things that I think really um, inspired me to think about the possibilities of, you know, getting land um, to Black and Brown folks within our community um, in, in concrete ways. Um, and with the work that we do with the Underground Center, we really are a place where we are like a think tank and experiential learning site that teaches young people and also adults, you know, how to build sustainably, how to um, utilize, um, you know, what's around us to to meet our needs directly. And so the, it just made sense that, you know, the next step um, in that process of educating young people about land and how to steward it and how to build naturally and how to grow food was to then you know, make sure that members of the community have access to land. And I was really um, floored by some of the statistics when I first learned them that Shaniqua had um, already shared with everyone here. But um, one thing that really kind of floored me, especially looking at New York, um, was that 98% of the rural land in New York State is all owned by white people. 98%. Um, Leah Penniman, who is from Soul Fire Farm, wrote a book a few years ago called Farming While Black and talks a lot about that statistic and just, um, you know, the shift of particularly my county, Ulster County, which relied on at a certain point in time heavily on the labor of Black people um, for farming and then to completely have all of that land completely dispersed and change hands um, where black farmers have absolutely no access in New York. You know, it's again, 98% of rural land. It's not even getting into um, urban stuff, just rural land is owned by white people. Um, so this work that we're talking about with land and black hands and um, being on the steering committee is really important to me because um, Black and brown residents here, Black and Indigenous residents here um, want to farm, want land. And here we are in one of the worst, you know, housing crises 
ever. There's always been a crisis for black and brown folks and for poor folks, but now it's really, um, you know, people are really paying attention now that they see for in our area, you know, housing prices and land prices skyrocketing. Now it's like this big spotlight. But again, in, in those conversations, we're again seeing black and brown folks indigenous folks, poor folks being left out of, of access to land, priced out of land. And that's a cycle that I really want to, to change, that the Underground Center wants to change. Um, and that is behind my partnership with um, the Land and Black Hands initiative that Shaniqua Bowden and the Kingston Land Trust started. Thank you, that is wonderful. Um, a question came in. They wanted to know what project are you working with the community right now? So right now um, we have a partnership in Saugerties um, of um, gardens, community gardens that we're working with, with the Boys and Girls Club, but also just with local folks um, who are down to uh, not only grow food, but practice land sharing. Um, and I do believe that this is this is really big. I mean, aside from the fact that we need a huge movement of that 98% of rural land being redistributed to folks um, in the interim until we can actually we can actually make that a, a reality. One of the things that we do at the UGC at the Underground Center is introduce folks to land sharing through first through growing food um, and what that's like to share land, have other community members come onto, onto private land and open up those private stage, um, spaces and basically create, recreate um, sort of like a commons, like you heard what was mentioned uh, within the video. So actually opening up private land to the public, to the community, and specifically really to black and brown folks within the community specifically. Um, so that's kind of been our initiative for the first, for these last five years, um, along with building as much infrastructure um, as we can and training as, ma as many um, young people, black, brown, and, and poor young people, how to build infrastructure, how to build without using fossil fuels, how to grow food without using fossil fuels. So just kind of shifting um, the way that we interact with land um, and also, again, opening up private property as much as as much as possible, and getting people to the idea of, of sharing, um, because it, it will have to happen. You know, at some point, I always say, you know, either it's something that those ninety eight percent landowners are going to do, um, you know, and learn how to do willingly, or it can get, you know. When it comes to land and people being unhoused and not having at land access, it gets uglier, right? Um, and again, learning how to share um, comes hard for folks. <laughs> Learn how to share is really tough. Um, they, but we see so many people open up with, with the children, especially with little kids. And before you know it, those first forays into land sharing with building gardens with young kids within the community then expands. And the next thing you know, someone's like, hmm, you know, um, a rain catch sounds like a good idea or actually, you know, a tiny house to help house folks within the community who need housing, I'm down for that. So again, it's um, trying to build those relationships and specifically up, uplift black and brown people within our community and give them access to land that they wouldn't have access to because everything has been kind of swooped up and privatized. Yeah, that's a very powerful point there about privatization. <laughs> um, a question came in. What gave you the idea to create the Underground Center and why? The Underground Center came after about five or six years of community organizing uh, prior. And one of the things that um, my partner and I, Chase Randell, you know, noted is that the demographics who, who need access to land and, and learning the skills were not being reached, you know, through those first forays. Um, in the Hudson Valley where we are, um, you know, maybe um, if you kind of look at it as this idea, you know, if you build it, folks will come, you know, we, 
we kind of did that, you know, especially my partner Chase with opening things up, but who comes in this area are usually white people, wealthy white people. And again, it tends to lock out black people, indigenous folks, Latinos, um, a lot of folks who then are kind of just overlooked within the whole process of talking about land and environmentalism are just completely locked out. And so the Underground Center was born out of the fact that um, if the demographic that needs the most help and that we want to help um, you know, is not being reached, an organization has to have that within its mind from the get-go. It's very difficult then to go back and then try and bring people in. You know, a lot of folks aren't welcome. <laughs> you know, they they aren't welcomed by by the folks who are owning land, you know, and it can be kind of a difficult situation then to go backtrack and say, okay, we're gonna introduce people of color to this to this circle and then folks are up in arms, you know. So we really wanted to start off with the fact that this is about uplifting uh, black, brown, indigenous, and poor folks within the community as much as possible and making sure that people learn skills, um, sustainable skills that don't rely on expect, uh, exploitation or fossil fuels, but also um, gets land into black and brown and indigenous hands. Great, wonderful work. Thank you so much for that. Um, another question has come in. Uh, and this one is from our wonderful WLC executive director. He, he said he loves your insight and amazing work. He'd like to know how can folks get involved to make a difference in their own communities? The so one thing that um, my partner and I always talk about is that we try and build systems that are that can be replicated elsewhere. You know, that is the whole point. So unlike a lot of different places where their site is for everything and everybody comes there, we try as much as possible to have the underground center itself be a demonstration space of what can be. And it's a space where young people can try out ideas um, and see how they work, but then take them out into the community. And so that is something that, that we love to, to talk about and share is, is techniques, especially with folks who are looking at, you know, within their own area saying, okay, I want to, you know, reach out to local youth, work specifically with black and brown youth, bring in these skills and teach um, these skills to folks so that they, they, they pass on and that it spreads, right? Um, we've noticed, you know, oftentimes with some environmentalist groups, it tends to be very kind of small or even if it's large, kind of close knit and on one site. And because of that, people don't really see the potential and how, you know, for anything to be successful, it, it does have to catch on. It has to spread. You have to take it outside of that, that small space. So um, getting involved um, with the work that, that we do, we, we always like to have people come, um, you know, to learn about the kind of work that we're doing. But the idea is take that information and spread it out, you know, get trained, learn the skills, and then move that to your own community. We want to try and empower folks to, to do this work for their own communities as much as possible. That's great. We'd love to see this more in Woodstock too, I'm sure. Um, so another question has come in. What do you think are the positives of giving land to people of color? I think there are a lot of positives. You know, people of color um, have over time, for many of the reasons that Shaniqua had mentioned at the beginning of this program have just been, um, you know, disconnected from, from land for many different reasons because of um, oftentimes just the, the idea of, of working land is sometimes a hurdle that has to be over, overcome because so many of us have a history, a very painful history with land of being forced from our land of being forced to work other people's land, right? So the healing process of reconnecting to land, I think is really important. And it's about um, food sovereignty. It's about um, community. It's about uh, security on all the same reasons why, you know, white people have land, <laughs> you know, why 
um, why opening land is, is, it's not thought of, you know, that question, you, you know, will rarely, I think, be, be given to someone white on what, you know, why, why, do, why is it a good thing? Um, it's a good thing for black and brown folks for the same reasons it is for, for you know, other people. Um, black and brown people, for those reasons that Shaniqua mentioned before, have been systemically cut out of um, land acquisition. It's gotten worse over time instead of gotten better. You would think that after enslavement, the access to land for black and brown folks would have improved, and it did not. You know, again, 98% in New York State, 98% of rural land is owned by white people, which is again another systemic issue. It's not that there aren't black people who want to be farmers. You know, it's not that we are, have a shortage of people that want to work with land. That land is locked, you know, and, and we're not able to access it. And that is wrong. You know, it's, it's not fair. It's not wrong. It's wrong. And I think that, um, you know, some rights have to be, have to be done. Um, we have to rectify some wrongs. You know, that 40 acre and a mule that, that black people never got it's time for that. It is time for reparations. It's time for us to look back at the indigenous practices of the people who were here and find out what we can do to save our world. You know, these are very real concepts. So to that question about, you know, what is good about giving land to, to black and brown folks um, who have, you know, within their histories, I mean, recent history, very real wisdom about growing wisdom that has been taken and repackaged as permaculture that I should say, oftentimes without giving credit to the African and, and indigenous communities who created those practices, right? Um, I think we need to go back to that source and everyone look at the things that really did work in indigenous communities and African communities. And we need to see how to employ those things now, how to work those things now. We've seen what it's like because of COVID when there is a, uh, just a blip in the supply chain, <laughs> you know? We've all seen that, we've all experienced that. Um, it is very real what we are facing now. And um, it's really important for folks to get those skills on how to grow food and how to steward land. And that should not just be a white people thing. Great. Um, my question is, how do you see land trusts um, partnering with this effort, um, especially in more rural areas and, you know, because you're partnering with an urban land trust, how can a land trust in a more rural area like the Woodstock Land Conservancy, you know, be an ally and support this effort? I think that, you know, uh, you know, Woodstock's Land Conservancy and some of the other um, land programs that we have a lot can, can learn a lot from the Kingston Land Trust and Land in Black Hands. Kingston, yeah, people think of, you know, there's the city, but there's a lot of rural spaces. There's a lot of farmland around Kingston as well. And I really love what um, Shaniqua and the Land Trust have, have kind of done with being able to come in and, and get the land, you know, land that's become derelict, that isn't being taken care of, that's fallen apart because people aren't there, folks are too elderly, and be able to say this land can be fertile land. This land can help the community. How can we get it to folks who um, through the usual channels would not get this land because everything is just locked, right? Everything is owned mostly by white people. So I, that idea is um, I think foundational to what we do at the Underground Center. Ultimately, as we talk about stewarding land and learning these skills, um, one of the things that we work on is also land is preservation. Um, so when Shaniqua um, approached me about the idea of land and black hands and, and talking about how do we get land within our area to black and brown folks, it just made so much sense. It just makes sense that a land trust can help uh, facilitate that. Um, that process where the biggest barrier for many black and brown folks is cost, uh, is, is the overhead and the cost. And if either some, through some kind of partnership or through um, the type of um, relationships that we kind of steward along with the underground center where people are sharing their private land with folks or a land trust that can acquire land 
that would otherwise go to auction or just completely just fall apart and get that to folks who can really uh, rejuvenate that land. It's, it's so important. It's such an important step um, of, be, of having an entity um, that can help facilitate that. Yeah, I mean, I think that partnership is key in making a lot of changes in systematic, you know, in the systems that are broken at the moment. So mm -hmm. I love this idea of collaboration and partnerships to build better, more vibrant communities. Um, there's another question that came in asking if any other organizations or municipalities or government um, institutions support your work at the Underground Center. We do a lot of work. Um, again, we focus on uh, young people um, from, like I said, the little ones of the Boys and Girls Club, but also we've partnered um, a lot with local colleges as well, with college students who are interested in environmentalism. Um, we've done a lot of work, especially with BARD uh, BIOP, their um, EOP program at BARD, working with those uh, black and brown students to get them you know, to the land um, to experience the land. A lot of folks um, don't have that opportunity and they're studying environmentalism. They're studying like environmentalism and environmental justice and they don't get to be in the environment <laughs> at all um, because it's all about policy and theory. So, you know, getting young people excited about land and learning about land is, is really important to this work. And so um, we often, you know, try and focus as, as much as we, we possibly can on young people, because we feel that, that that's where change really is, is going to come. You know, older folks, we don't like to change, <laughs> but the younger folks, you know, um, can learn those skills and kind of push that change forward. And so that has been really huge, um, partnering with college students too, who can then get those skills and take it to the next level. Again, that idea of seeding this in other communities. Another question I have is, what communities are you currently working on projects in, in, or are you just trying to focus very narrowly in your own community? Mm -hmm. We're focusing in Saugerties. This, um, we kind of push back on purpose with this idea of growth, 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 and spread out, spread out, spread out. No, we, we don't want to spread out. We want folks to learn and they spread out right instead of burning folks out you know <laughs> in, in one space um and that's some that's another thing that we often um run into the idea is to learn the skills and each one teach one and kind of spread spread that out instead of um just our organization just kind of doing doing everything right um so that really is um you know our focus so we're in located within Saugerties and a lot of the land sharing is about relationship building. You have to get to know your neighbors. You have to get to know who lives around you. It's important work, you know, and that can't that can't just be skipped or passed over or anything like that. It's important work to build that trust. And so we model that process for other groups. Um, the young people who come and work with us and the volunteers, the adult volunteers who work with us all then become a part of that uh, community and the sharing and it goes from uh, helping folks who are in need sharing food whatever it whatever it may be and from there the relationships then tend to to then naturally go to the next step right when you know people um, when you get to spend time with them when you work side by side with them it's really difficult to hold on to isms you know in that situation um, when you're working side by side um, you really get to know people and respect them. And the work is the glue, right? Working for that common, that common goal is, is really the glue. And so we really want that to, to replicate and for folks to then take that into their own communities and spread that way. It's amazing. I love it. <laughs> um, another question has come in. What's the future you you would like to see? What's your vision for the future of land and ownership or stewardship? Oh my goodness. I am hoping that um, things will not have to get worse before they get better. We've been talking about these ideas, my partner and I with the Underground Center for over 10 years now, you know, in, in different forms, five, 
going on six years now as the underground center. And even before that, and it, it always seems that the interest often comes at, on the heels of some kind of crisis. And then once the crisis is kind of quelled a little bit, then people just go back to their ordinary way of life. But at, I'm just hoping at some point people can, can realize that it's, things aren't gonna go back. They're gonna steadily, from our view, steadily become worse. Um, we're in an environmental crisis right now um, that is going to affect all of us, black, white, rich, poor, across the board. And if we do not learn how to share you know, with each other and trust one another and learn how to build community and get to know our neighbors and learn how to grow food and, and take care of one another, we're, we're really going to be um, in, a, in a dark place. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, the, the tragedy of, of, of COVID, um, that at least something good to come out of it would be folks understanding just how uh, fragile our current system is and how much we need one another. And that that can then spur people into maybe looking at their relationship to land, uh, maybe looking at the land that they own, the rural land that they own and thinking about what, what good can I do with this land? How can I open this land up in a, a way to educate people or to share and that we start to do that sooner than later? Wonderful. Let's open it up. Let's share. I love sharing. Yeah. <laughs> it's that uh, what you learned in kindergarten. It's the ultimate, yeah. you know, first skill that yeah. you should learn. It's and I still, feel and it's, it's, yeah, it's still so important. Yeah. It's still so important. Those basics, we never get far from that. And, and with, with all of that is also that idea of infrastructure, build, building things that can, that can last for us and actually work and that aren't exploited. It doesn't exploit people. It's not exploiting the land. It actually nourishes the land that we work on. That's what land stewardship really is about. And again, you know, hopefully it's a lesson that we can, we can learn quickly, <laughs> you know, sooner the better. Yeah, I can imagine that the climate crisis will just continue to magnify this issue and make it even harder for, you know, the Black community to access land. So I appreciate the work that mm -hmm. you're doing. It is so incredibly important. Um, and we've now come to run out of time. Shaniqua, I believe, would like to say one last thing before we close out the evening. But Cassandra, thank you so much for your incredible insight and in the work that you're doing at the Underground Center. It's well needed. And we are fully behind your efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Ellie, I don't actually have another comment. You had opened up the floor. I was going to ask another question. This I ask you another question. We still have a few more minutes if, we, if you would like. <laughs> we... Go right ahead, Shaniqua. Yeah, I think I actually uh, forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I, I think as you were talking about, um, oh, you were talking about doing a lot of the work without fossil fuels and, you know, and, and being extractive, right? So I started thinking about why do people still employ these methods, you know, because it's so much easier, right? So I just bought a house, you know, finally, and I'm outside and I'm thinking about, you know, permaculture and all these great things, right? How it could be regenerative and stuff. And I hear, the lawnmowers going all around me. And I say, man, people are still, <laughs> people are still mowing the lawn. They didn't get the memo about climate change and fossil fuels, you know? <laughs> so I'm almost like, um, I think my question to you is like, and I think about convenience, I guess people still do this out of convenience, right? And they're not thinking about the effects. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, someone who has, I think you have a, a pretty sizable piece of land out there. And I'm like, can you tell us about, you know, how you're doing things in such a way that you're not always focused on convenience and the easy way and how quickly you can get something done, you know, with the practices that you're employing? How do you stay focused in that realm as well? Yeah, it can be, it can be tough. You know, people are always like, well, we just, if you just bring the machine over, we could do this really quickly. But I'm always, I guess what I keep in the back of my mind is it, it may not always be around, you know, again, on, on all many different levels, you know, we've talked about 
you know, fossil fuels and how it's not this constant, you know, sustainable or renewable energy that people think that will always be there. But again, like I said, um, the last few years with COVID, I think put that into stark relief for a lot of people. Um, you know, when you see, you know, how our reliance on technology and gas and all of these things can skyrocket or stop or, you know, based on the whim, you know, or based on a market or based on disaster. Um, I always try to keep that in the back of my mind. People spend a lot of time learning new skills. People do it all the time. They learn something new if, they, if they're really into it, whether it's playing a new video game or whether it's doing something else. So I tend to look at the idea of when people are like, oh, how do, how do you all learn all of this stuff? It's the same way that people learn with any new interest, right? If you set your mind to it and practice and learn, you can learn it. That's how we learn enough to teach other people. Each one teach one. And again, it's about shifting uh, priorities and you know sticking to it. And when you have community, you have a lot of support. Um, in Saugerties and in Woodstock, we're really lucky. We have a lot of rural folks and we have these communities of folks who, like white people who grew up knowing how to um, hunt and build and do all this different kind of stuff. And then we have like the New York City transplants who come who don't know any of that. And the two like never interact with each other. And it's like, these are two groups that if they would actually put differences aside and could get together and actually teach each other a lot of stuff, you know, like really useful, helpful stuff. And so I tend to look at it through through that lens that, um, you know, the, the things that we have now um, may not always be there. And so, you know, it's important to learn these skills and pass them on the same way that you would learn other skills and pass them on. And any type of opportunity where we can get um, those different groups of people together to share is going to be, it's gonna be a win. It's gonna be a positive. Sounds great, thank you. I love the idea of kind of skill sharing to improve the community character, to make sure that, you know, you're building these communities that, you know, can stand the test of time. I think it's, you know, where we need to be headed. Um, so once again, I'm gonna give you a huge thank you. I appreciate your time, the effort, the work you do. It's so wonderful. I'm going to now throw it back to Kirk so that he can say a few things about, you know, the programs that are coming up, the end of the film series. Um, and thank you once again, Shaniqua and Cassandra for everything. Kirk, mm. on to you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ellie. Well, I was also just going to thank Shaniqua and Cassandra, but uh, that's been for the work you've been doing in Land and Black Hands and underground, uh, your underground, the U UGC Underground Center. And LA will be sending out resources uh, that will be associated with uh, this event uh, in the coming days. So look for that. There were some resources listed. And also in the link in the chat, there is a link um, that you could uh, access for. Do, uh, making donations to Land in Black Hands to help continue their work. And lastly, I just would like to invite everyone to come back and join us again for our fourth event and final event of the year. Uh, that will be um, on Monday, April 25th. Um, and it was in the title or the, 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 this event is called the 21st Century Economics, Designing an Economy for Human Values. Uh, it'll be our last series of the 10th annual films and discussion series of this year. And we look forward to seeing everyone at that point. Again, if you'd like to find more information about that, you'll, you can access it through the uh, way that you uh, signed up for this event, either through the Land Conservancy, the Jewish Community Center or from Woodstock Transition. In that, I'd like to thank again, everyone for attending this evening. It's been a great pleasure for the, uh, to see you all. It's always great to see everyone to get, uh, gather together, even if it's in these small little boxes. One of these days we'll have a chance to get together again, I'm sure in person. With no further ado, I'd like to again say good night and thank you for attending.